think we might kick off, Shane. So look, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first quarter of our four-quarter four quarter finance webinar series. Um, as we've said in the invite, we, we plan on each quarter uh, being joined by guests um, and panelists that will help hopefully build your financial knowledge and empower and, and your, your investment decisions. Um, today, I'm joined by Shane Wakeland, who's the Director of Distribution at Faulkner. So formally welcome, Shane, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Glenn, and good afternoon to everyone. It's been a pleasure to uh, join you. No, thanks, Shane. And look, before we, we kick off, just a few housekeeping issues. Um, look, obviously, everything we discussed today is just of a general nature. Um, so what we're talking about may not necessarily be appropriate to you or your personal circumstances. Um, it is a bit fairly informal sort of discussion. So we do invite and encourage you to place questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and, we, and we will try and answer those as, as we go. And if we can't do it during the webinar, we will attend to all those questions at the end. So definitely encourage a lot of engagement in today's discussion, whether that be questions or, or, or comments, and we will definitely try and address all of those. Um, so look, Shane, just to, I suppose, kick things off and, and begin our discussion, um, perhaps if you can just give us a little bit of a background as to who Faulkner is and, and really what their niche is within that property space. Yeah, absolutely, Glenn. Well, we're, we consider ourselves a core property fund manager that focuses on, on essential services and convenience retail. And, and I guess when we break that down, everyone's been very familiar with the word of essential services over the, over the last 18 months and, and, and two years of, of COVID. But when we talk about essential services, we, we talk about convenience retail, so everyone knows about service stations and QSR, quick service restaurants. We talk about childcare, early learning centres and the significant amount of federal government funding that's flowed in, in particular over the last 18 months. And then we talk about those real neighbourhood and sub-regional focused shopping centres that have really outperformed during this COVID period. So that, that, that's been a real template and a real clear strategy of the firm over a course of 10 to 11 years. So, so that particular strategy with the convenience retail, you said the childcare centres uh, and those regional shopping centres, has that, obviously that's been a long-term sort of philosophy of Faulkner. How have you found that really benefit the investor during this time that we've had in the last couple of years where there's been a lot of restrictions, a, a lot of discussion about how COVID will impact property? H have you found that that's sort of reinforced that strategy and, and that you'll sort of press ahead continuing down that path? Yes, it has, Glenn. It's been an incredibly rewarding period for us. I guess when we and our managing director started out with the blank sheet of paper going back 10 or 11 years ago, it really started with some of those key learnings from the GFC and some of those were, were well, what, what did perform really, really well in unlisted property trusts and some of those listed REITs? And one of the key themes that came out was that during that GFC, that, that really tough financial period, the service station type properties, long-term leases, fixed rental increases, and really strong financially backed ASX listed tenants and a really strong financial, uh, financially backed private operators performed incredibly well. So I guess using that strategy that was a real target area for Faulkner early days. And then ultimately what we've seen, and we've always had this theme internally that we want to build unlisted property trusts that are recession proof and that can ultimately survive black swan events. Now it's okay to, to, to set that as a clear strategy and to target those particular essential services, but it's not until you actually reach those period and if we were sitting here in April, May last year, um, and you're looking at the equity markets and all your, your clients and investors are looking at the equities markets, there was a lot of uncertainty around. And then ultimately what happened in that six month period was you had sectors of commercial property that were really, really impacted, office CBD, the large shopping malls. And then interestingly, what you saw was this huge demand for do-it-yourself self-managed super fund, high net worth individuals wanting security of income and yield. And a lot of it went, went to service stations and early learning centres. So what it did, it, it, it was a period of disruption, dislocation, and it really 
reinforced our strategy that essential services investing, rain, hail or shine is going to continue to provide security of income from our investors because that's what we care about. And two, it's obviously created this cap rate compression where the valuations have gone up. And I think um, in this low interest rate environment, that's certainly been very rewarding, but it's it's been equally as rewarding knowing that the strategy has stood up in what, have, what has been one of the, the toughest periods in the last 50 years. No, absolutely. And just on, I mean, that term essential service is probably one that up until recently, we hadn't heard a lot about. I mean, it's definitely come to the fore with, the situation that we've all been in the last sort of 12 to 18 months and even even 24 months as far as essential services from Faulkner's perspective when you're focusing on assets to purchase for your investors what do you classify as essential services and what forms part of that sector for Faulkner? Yeah so I guess broadly speaking you could also throw in health um, obviously health centres, um, dentists, uh, doctors um, and then you could also evolve, it also evolves into Kmart, Coles, Woolworths, Audi, pharmacists. And then that, that then goes off on a tangent into what we call our, our non-discretionary retail um, shopping centres, which have performed very, very strongly. For us, it's very much around service stations and QSR. QSR may not be a terminology everyone's familiar with, but it's McDonald's, Hungry Jack's, Carl's Jr., Red Rooster. And ultimately what happened during COVID is that, uh, sure, the, the in-store dining, um, uh, certainly uh, traffic certainly dried up because of the restrictions, but the drive-through went through the roof. So ultimately the reason we love those essential services tenants um, is because they're very profitable and in times of disruption and dislocation, they continue to be open. So whether it's bushfires, whether it's COVID, um, they have a really, really important role and an essential service role in, in the community. And, and as you said, Shane, the, the attractiveness of this sort of asset, which has really been highlighted as a result of COVID, because they are very resilient, very defensive, has led to that cap rate compression. Just for our attendees, could you just explain what that actually means and how that affects the underlying values of the properties? Yeah, absolutely. So if we looked at the commercial property um, uh, industry more broadly, we've had office CBD, we've had office more broadly um, go through a really, really difficult period and how, how, what that sort of tail is in terms of recovery, that'll it'll be what it'll be. Um, I guess, um, and that's arguably one of the largest parts of the investment market, whether it's large institutionals or super funds investing in that space. Uh, you then also have the industrial and supply chain, which has obviously been a, a very, very strong performing area. Um, and then you have your traditional strip retail um, type assets that a lot of do-it-yourselfers would, would traditionally buy, um, as well as your smaller CBD buildings. A lot of those sectors, putting aside industrial supply chain, have ultimately stopped paying rent. The tenants have stopped paying rent. So you've had this sheer weight of money that is looking for a home. And if you're looking at price points of both childcare, service stations, you're in that real sweet spot of anywhere between three to $20 million that with leverage is, is quite affordable to your high net worth, your family offices. And so you've had this sheer weight of money moving into their area because it's security of income, essential services, which has obviously resulted in increasing valuations and what we call yield, yield compression or cap rate, cap rate compression. So for all of our investors in our service station trusts and also our diversified trusts, it's been a very, very um, positive, positive period for them. And just on that, with that obviously impacting the market, impacting the valuations of properties, arguably making it more difficult to identify value because as you were saying, that competition has really broadened and it's, it's put a massive focus on those sorts of, sorts of assets. So if we're focusing on you know, childcare, we'll come back to the regional shopping centres in a moment, but if we're focusing on childcare and service stations, which as you said, that pricing point can be very open to a lot of potential buyers, how does Faulkner then identify value and realise value for, it, for its investors? 
Yeah, so we've certainly had to think outside the square and, and ultimately it's really come back to our relationships. I mean, um, our head of um, acquisitions, our, our GM of property is uh, Stuart Turner. Stuart was, Stuart was 18 years at Shell and then five years leading up the Viva REIT. And we're incredibly fortunate to have him as, um, I guess, our leader in terms of looking at opportunity incredibly knowledgeable development backgrounds, so very strong relationships with developers around the country um, who, who facilitate and put a lot of these deals together. Um, he's um, at institutional level, obviously a very strong relationship with the Waypoint group. So off the back of his uh, leadership, he's thought outside the square. So what we've turned to is, is doing a lot more of what we call construction fund throughs. We're not in the business of developing. We're not in the business of taking on considerable risks on behalf of our investors. But what we've structured in regard to our construction fund throughs is we very much take the role of settling on the land, funding construction, um, and um, structuring those particular properties within the trust. And while that's, why that's really, really important is through those relationships, we're able to give the developers certainty of settlement. We're able to buy on yields that are generally between 50 and 100 basis points above what you would see in the market or more. And then the second key pillar to that strategy has been to look at portfolio opportunities. And um, the Viva REIT is one change of strategy, new CEO, and Stuart was fortunate enough to identify an opportunity there. So they've been two initiatives where we've certainly had to be very proactive. We acknowledge that, and, and traditionally we've never been buyers at a Burgess Rawson or CBRE auction. It's always been Trying to, trying to identify better value through our relationships. And that's, that's really come to the fore. That's 10, 11 year relationships that have really come to the fore in this period. So in relation to, as you said, a lot of, or potentially most of these assets you're buying off market um, and also through those relationships. Um, so obviously it's very difficult for, I suppose, a mum and dad investor to be able to, to access the sort of properties that, that Faulkner is getting access to. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, that's correct, Glenn. And um, look, the, the, an important um, consideration for any investor too is, the, is ultimately the quality of the asset. And um, when you've got um, a lot of research at your disposal, you've got a lot of industry knowledge, you can ultimately determine what properties you do and don't buy. And um, that's certainly been the case um, in regard to our approach over the course of the last 18 months. Um, I think we've looked at in the order of 125 individual service station properties and we've purchased in the order of about 30, 35 and, or, or actually 40 with a considerable amount of them being through the, the Viva REIT. So, um, and that, that, that um, flows through to everything from environmental auditing processes, the, ultimately the disciplines you take in your DD process. So um, for you do it yourself, they obviously take on a lot more risk uh, without that knowledge at their disposal. No, absolutely. And, and just a question um, from Boris, and, and once again, encourage as many questions as we can. Um, just looking at the, the yields from, the, from essential services properties, whether that relates to Faulkner's uh, particular syndicates, which we'll have a talk about how they're structured, but um, generally, how does the yield from essential services properties compare to other commercial properties, whether that be office or all the strip shop type assets? Yeah, yeah, difficult, difficult question. Um, so to give you an insight, the uh, portfolio of service stations in our latest trusts were purchased on an average yield of 6.1%. Uh, um, if we were to look back, say, two, three years ago, they were a little bit higher, around that 6.5%. But in the private markets, Burgess, Ross and CBRE, it's not unusual to consistently see high threes and early fours. So there, there's some context for you. Um, look, the strip retails, um, subject to the type of tenancy, um, you know, traditionally, and, and we're still seeing strong results in a number of those properties where I think people are just looking to, 
to put cash to work and, and, yeah. and put it into bricks and mortar. But uh, in that area, you'll generally find your four, four to five percent yields. Um, across the childcare sector, um, similar to the service stations, going back two, three years ago, mid sixes, and now you're consistently seeing those, those early 5% yields. With ASX listed tenants like a, um, a G8, for example, the cap rates will be lower um, because obviously of the strength of the covenant. And then if you go through to industrial supply chain, well, you know, you, you're seeing some really um, silly yields, but that, they're, they're all different strategies as well. Every, each fund manager has their own niche, their own strategy. Yeah. Um, I've seen a number of uh, um, industrial supply chain achieving sort of mid 3% yields. Now there could be an underlying land play, long-term land play uh, in future, but it's really horses for courses and it comes back ultimately to to being true to our strategy. That's that's what we reinforce on a weekly basis. And, and just on that, as we discussed earlier, like the compression of those cap rates, which for, for the attendees, that's essentially just the, the yield that you're receiving from your investment just falling. Um, arguably, has do you feel as though, I mean, I think a lot of people may agree that that's really been driven by the low interest rate environment, where people don't have a choice but to buy these sorts of assets and compromise on a lower return than perhaps what they would have experienced previously? Absolutely, Glenn. And I think the relevant question there also is, at this point in the interest rate cycle, what, what are your, your strategies to protect capital? And as you well know, we, we've been able to achieve some really strong capital growth across all of our trusts um, over a long period of time, but in particular the last three to four years. And I, I guess when we look at the, the typical service station, 12, 15 year lease agreements, every year the rent goes up by 3% fixed, no market reviews. And that's obviously driving up that valuation increase. So if we talk about the current interest rate cycle, our strategy is the fixed rental income increases, which contributes to the uplift in valuations. And that's a natural hedge against inflation or interest rates increasing over the investment term. So that's a really important part of our strategy when we diversify trust with, you know, your, your convenient shopping centre, your childcare and your, your, um, your, your service stations. We ideally want to see that 50%, 60% of the portfolio just has that year on year growth. And in the event, if interest rates or inflation does kick in and, and, and increases quicker than what we all expect, and we acknowledge that the RBA supposedly won't move till 2024, that's, that's protecting our, our investors' capital and it's still increasing the valuation and it provides a really strong buffer in the event that the interest rates do increase. So it's a very disciplined... Um, risk mitigation approach to, to building a, a really resilient property trust. And just in relation to service stations, I mean, it's definitely um, something that I've got a few questions about that I know a lot of clients have asked, but just in relation to the comment you were making about the, the lease terms and that progressive increase in income, essentially in line with inflation, one of the other key features is that triple net type arrangement. Could you just perhaps spend a little bit of time discussing what the terms of the leases, generally speaking, are for a service station in relation to income, but also obligations of, of the actual tenant in that scenario as well? Yeah, sure. So if you think about the typical service station, um, when we refer to a triple net, triple net lease, that means the tenant is responsible for all the maintenance and all the capex. So that, that, is, that is the perfect lease for a landlord. So all of our Shell Coles Express leases are triple net leases. So we receive the cash and where we can, we try, as many, we try to buy as many brand new properties as we can. Um, that's the perfect scenario. Then you have your double net leases where the landlord may be responsible for your land tax. That is different from state to state, um, subject to different different um, tenancy agreements. 
And then you have your, your CapEx or your ongoing maintenance CapEx. So where we can, we obviously want to achieve, in particular with all our brand new service station triple net leases, but sometimes that, that, that negotiation doesn't always fall our way. But where we can uh, have as many uh, double net leases as we can. Um, in simple terms, uh, what, that, what that simply means is with triple net leases, all the income goes into the trust bank account and obviously pays interest on the debt and pays our, importantly pays our investors. And it's less going back the other way to our tenants to maintain the property. And in, in relation to, I suppose, the locations of service stations, I mean, a lot of people would agree that they're generally in suburban locations, obviously on major arterials. Um, a question that I often get is what happens at the end of that lease? Like we've all sort of driven past, you know, old service stations that have been yep. knocked down and repurposed. Um, as far as contamination and the obligation on the tenant in that regard, um, I mean, obviously, when we're investing in service stations, we're investing for that inc income stream potentially and the security of the of the tenant. But there's also potentially that long term attraction as well as to where the assets located, whether that's potential residential development. Is that something that that you look into as well as far as the long term benefits of owning that sort of asset in that location? And then also what needs to be done to the site in order to perhaps change it to another purpose? Yeah, great question, Glenn. Um, so um, firstly, I'll just touch on the location strategy. So we always take a diversified location um, construction approach. So that's, we will buy in regional cities. We will buy in out of metro. Um, we had a we've had a really clear strategy of uh, um, buying in those residential growth corridors. So that continues to be a real key focus. So, so that's one point to make. Um, Two, in terms of where the liability sits, and this is a really important thing for investors to understand, is that the environmental liability sits with the tenant. Um, so um, as you, uh, all, all of your clients and everyone on the uh, webinar would, would acknowledge, um, the, 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 the banks who we obviously borrow money from to partly fund uh, the acquisitions of the service stations, they have incredibly strict environmental sustainability um, risk mitigation requirements and processes. So we, we first and foremost, we've got to meet them. And one of them is a clear understanding um, around uh, where the liability and future liability for ultimately the cleanup of the site. In the, in the worst case scenario, the, 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 the property isn't released. So that's a really important uh, point to understand. Um, in a worst case scenario with one of our 12 or 15 year lease agreements, if it got to the end, acknowledging that we have six and seven year investment terms, mm -hmm. if it got to the end of the lease, it wasn't renewed, that particular site has to be cleaned up by the tenant. So that's their obligation as um, part of doing business on that site for a 12, 15 year period. And that's gotta be brought back to the, the environmental standards prior to that construction. And of course, um, the modern technology around uh, you know, double line fiberglass tanks and um, the environmental monitoring systems are, have, have improved significantly over a 10 year period. And does that asset just, leveraging off a question that's just been asked, does that asset then have to be vacant for a number of years after the service station has essentially been removed from that site? So with those that have got the older technology, so, and, and I can hear that, I've, and we've all driven across those sites that may have been vacant for 18 months, two years, they're predominantly off the back of old, old technology. We've Predominantly, 99% of our properties are only brand new or relatively new with the double line fiberglass tanks. Um, we haven't had to work with them, um, but um, those, um, those, I guess that liability um, is in the circumstances of that old technology still tanks environmental contamination. Okay. And in relation to the um, income mix from those sites, so as we all know, service stations, it's not just fuel, there's the convenience retail piece, quite often there's, uh, you know, fast food outlets. Generally, what do you see by way of, 
you know, revenue from those tenants? Is it mainly driven by fuel or is it really, is fuel just a part of it and it's really driven by those other factors? Yeah, great question. And this is for all the business owners who are, who are your clients, it's, they'll be really interested in this. So we, we obviously like the service stations from the point of view, there's the dual revenue streams, obviously fuel and convenience retail. Give you an insight, average 7-Eleven, for example, does about 4 million litres of fuel. Uh, as we know, with fuel margins, they do go up from time to time, but on an average of about 10 to 12 cents uh, per litre. Um, from, a, from a convenient retail sales point of view, you're looking at um, average about 2 million in retail sales on margins, gross margins of about 34%. Um, a couple of really important points to make is that during that uh, April, May, June, July period of COVID last year, uh, obviously significant drop off in drop off in in fuel demand, um, uh, but margins went from twelve cents and peaked at around about thirty five cents a litre. So a number of these service stations were able to actually protect protect um, our profit, um, and I guess. From uh, if we look back mid 80s, there are 21,000 service stations in the country. Now we're at about seven. Uh, passenger vehicles have increased significantly, and I I think what um, everyone would be familiar with is the emergence of convenience retail. You know, mini supermarkets. Um, the 7-Eleven story is quite a, a remarkable one um, from the point of view of their, their coffee strategy, their on-the-go on the food evolution um, has evolved them into the number one convenience retailer. They average pre-COVID about 500 cups of coffee per day per store. So, you know, it's very different to, to your local, you know, it's really your local milk bar and service station combined. You know, if we said the number of milk bars in the mid 80s were probably 10, 20,000, probably the same as service stations. And so um, and there's hardly a milk bar. So it, it's really become that role in, in all of our communities. Whether yeah, it's, it's almost replaced the old milk bar, hasn't it? Yeah, and whether that's when we're on a road trip or, or, or um, on the way home from work or whatever it may be. So it probably segue into another question in relation to the impact of electric vehicles, obviously, at the moment, that that draw, so to speak, of the of the service station is people drop in, get fuel, as you say, get a coffee, convenience, retail, and what have you. And I know that Falcon has done a lot of work in this space in relation to the future and people potentially transitioning um, into electronic vehicles. How do you see that that sort of phenomena or that change impacting the service station that we see right now? Yeah, it, it's it's a really interesting area. Um, it's already started. So I think as you would respect and we've spoken about on a number of occasions, we rely on a lot of that intelligence and, and, and communication coming from our tenants. Uh, our tenants are 7-Eleven, BP, uh, Caltech slash Ampol, uh, Chevron are obviously now back in the market, Liberty, Shell Coles Express. And so they've already commenced their planning and strategy around capturing market opportunity. Um, I think one thing that we'd agree on is that being global energy distributors, uh, vertically integrated, most of them, apart from the 7-Eleven, um, they've always been um, proactive, throwing billions of dollars of resources at new opportunities. And ultimately, being the market leaders, in terms of new, new technology, new convenience offerings, and, and old, ultimately new fuels. So um, that's already started. Ampol have recently, the CEO of Ampol has, has recently uh, stated that they've, they've commenced their journey of, of, of incorporating um, electric vehicle fast charge on their, on their sites. Uh, hydrogen's coming very quickly in terms of that whole hydrogen supply chain in Australia. Um, so it, currently there's about 0.6% of new vehicle sales in electric vehicles. Um, we uh, put, a, put a huge amount of responsibility back on our tenants to ultimately continue to keep us informed. Um, and I guess one thing that I would comment on is that 
you know, there's always at times like these when you've got a new technology emerging there's quite often an unsophisticated discussion around the impact of for example electric vehicles but ultimately what will happen is that the service stations will um, capture market share hydrogen you can only fill up at, at obviously at a service station you won't have it at home but then there'll be the portfolio mix of fast charge and shopping centres, those commercial property or office holders in the CBD who can afford to spend that capex on fast charge um, um, in the cities, they'll spend it. So it's really going to be a portfolio mix of, of um, energy distribution points um, that'll ultimately drive the market. And, and just in relation to who you're buying these assets of, you, me you mentioned obviously some of the, the listed operators a selling assets is obviously you did mention that you, you you bought a few assets off those operators why are they divesting of some of the assets that i mean obviously within any market there's buyers and sellers like the share market any property that's transacting there's there's reasons why people are buying and reasons why people are selling but what is attracting you to those assets or why are the sellers looking at divesting of those assets yeah, so in the um, the Viva Read or slash the Waypoint Read portfolio, um, that was more corporate related. New CEO, new strategy. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to in increase whale to metropolitan areas, um, reduce the the weighted average portfolio from regional to metro. And in terms of what that meant for us, is we identified that as an opportunity potentially. Uh, pick up initially a portfolio of 10 properties, which then increased to 20 in, in, and it finally was 31 in total. Um, so we obviously had the inside um, knowledge and, and incredible knowledge through Stuart Turner. Um, but we've also, when we also look at the portfolio, we look at it from a value add opportunity. So even though we're a real core, um, core plus focused um, fund manager, we also saw the opportunity to um, potentially leverage a strategic partnership like a Liberty. And Liberty have got a, a very clear local um, uh, location strategy of regional areas, uh, regional cities, and a very strong focus on truck and diesel and a convenience retail offer, offering that's been very successful. And, it, and it's complementary to Shell Coles Express. So, when we look at the portfolio, we also look at it from the point of view of, okay, with our partnership with Liberty and our connection with Liberty, where can we potentially um, create those opportunities for them to come in on a number of those locations? So um, when it comes to the developers, the individual developers, you've sort of got two, two pools there. Um, developers will come to us, us with one or two or three properties. Um, they, they may have just secured a lease with a 7-Eleven or, or, um, or a BP um, and will agree to, to purchase that property at the end. Or we'll have a number of land developers that will come to us, present an opportunity and will facilitate an introduction to some of our key tenants. They'll put together an AFL, so an approved for lease. And then we'll be there as um, the acquirer of that property. And, and for playing that facilitation role, we're obviously um, negotiating a high yield for that particular property and a better, better price that we can pass on to investors. So it's a that, those types of examples are little arbitrage plays where yeah, once again it provides that nice little buffer because we've bought better on top of the fact they're brand new properties on 12 or 15 year leases. Yeah, sure. Just jumping back and just to answer a question from Miriam, um, who, who owned an asset and had a somewhat of a bad experience having the tenant um, do the environmental cleanup. How, how is that enforced, Shane, as far as is it just an obligation as part of the lease? And then how, as a landlord, do you enforce uh, that undertaking? Yeah, so one thing that we um, put strictly in place, in particular with uh, the service stations, is we where we can, we'll have directors' uh, bonds or we'll have a bond in place uh, for those circumstances. Um, I guess we're, we're, in a way we're fortunate, largely because of our strategy that all of our properties are on long-term leases. So we haven't had to deal with any situations where 
um, the property then becomes vacant um, as a result of the tenant not releasing. Um, but ultimately it comes back to your, your legal protection and, and what you put in place to, to, to protect your asset and not, not be left with um, out-of-pocket expenses based on the, the operating activity of, of um, your, your former tenant. And just the, the, obviously the nature of the long-term leases, as you said, a lot of them there, that could be 10 to 15 years, so very long-term if you compare that with, I suppose, a lot of invest, you know, mum and dad type investors have got an experience with residential type property where sometimes the leases are six months for a year. So these long-term leases that we're talking about are obviously that, you know, 15 year in nature. You mentioned that um, you often exit those assets before that. Could you just explain, the, I suppose, the normal time frame of these syndications and then who are, who are the buyers that are really attracted perhaps to a portfolio of assets in six to seven years' time and how that helps the investor? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, so um, I guess, yeah, seven-year seven year lease agreements. That, um, sorry, seven-year investment terms. What's really attractive in terms of having ideally all of your properties with 15-year leases is you do reach that invest, end of the investment term and you've still got a considerable lease term to, to go on the property. And, and also acknowledging that the day you bought the property to the seven years, you've got in the order of about 23% more income from that property purely because of the rental income increases. Um, the thing we really like about this asset class too is that it's one attractive to the institutionals, we've seen some of the large institutional fund managers like Charter Hall, overseas um, Singaporean company, GIC, uh, purchased BP and Ampol assets. So, so from an exit strategy, we know there's, there's a potential future portfolio sale approach. So that, that's certainly attractive where we can really create an arbitrage and a premium on top of um, what an individual site would be worth. But equally as important is the depth in the private market. Um, so you do it yourself, as we touched on before, yeah. you do it yourself, self-managed super fund and your high net worth individuals. And um, they are as liquid as, as any asset. You can put them to market in, in a two month period or one month marketing and a, and a one month sale process auction. And you can settle on the properties in 30 to 60 days. And that, that's a really important um, consideration, um, certainly when I'm talking to investors, because I genuinely want to communicate the legitimate redemption opportunity at the end of the investment term. And hence, multiple service stations within the trust values between sort of three to $10 million. We've obviously got some that are, are large highway sites with higher price points. But those fundamentals um, create a really good selling environment. And if we're buying really well at the start and we're selling into a, a competitive buying market, that, that obviously bodes well for long-term capital re return and also liquidity for our investors. And it's leaving something on the table for the next buyer, isn't it? I mean, a lot of the time that's what can extract value, isn't it? Not completely absolutely. drawing down a lease so there's nothing for, for a new buyer to be attracted to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, interesting on the v Viva uh, REIT portfolio acquisition, I'll just touch on this quickly. There were in the order of about 12 properties that we um, that, that we knocked back. Um, they didn't meet our, one, our location strategy and also our environmental auditing uh, process. Um, interestingly, they sold two weeks later on one on a 3.8% cap rate with five year lease to run and one was on a 4.2% cap rate or yield with uh, six years to run. Both South Australian properties, low stamp duty, but that, I guess, reflected the exceptional uh, buying, uh, but it also reflects the depth of the buying market out there as well. Yeah, I mean, as you said, I mean, the depth of the market and then the, in some ways you could argue it's the, the level of comfort that investors have in buying those assets because they're prepared to get you know, fairly low income return, aren't they? I mean, that's traditionally what you would have got from a residential type property. So yep, yep. Uh, it definitely sort of reinforces the comfort in that asset. 
Absolutely. And I think an important point to make there, Glenn, is the fact that, look, we're, we're here in the, in the interest rate cycle. Um, who knows what it's going to do over the next three to four years? Um, ideally, you know, um, the interest rates stay where we are. We're currently paying on our debt about two and a quarter percent. Um, but what's really, really important for any investor is back to the point I made before is what is that capital protection strategy? And an important part of that also is, is how you manage your debt levels. Um, obviously, with our trust, we're quite conservative in terms of our LVRs, but you always need to be looking ahead and you always need to be looking at five years ahead and running those scenario analysis in terms of um, what impact does an increasing interest rate environment have on your cash flows and what surplus cash flows are you holding back in the trust to ensure that you can consistently continue to pay that that income distribution to your investors as well as you know have some cash there to 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 make the most of opportunities that may pop up yeah absolutely changing tack for a little bit we'll spend a bit of time talking about the service stations which is a big part of Faulkner's strategy and expertise um, in more recent times uh, you, you've had a few more forays into that sub-regional shopping center so I'm interested and keen to have a bit of a discussion about Firstly, the definition of, okay, what is sub-regional shopping centres? Um, what has attracted Faulkner to that particular asset? And really the benefits for investors in investing in those sorts of assets as well. Yeah, so the best way to explain it is we take a, a top-down approach. So going back 12 months ago, we embarked on a significant research uh, project to full-time analyst really drilling down into portfolio of centre group, Stockland, vicinity, URW, SCA, and really uh, looking at the, the types of properties that were actually performing quite well. Um, we're obviously very, very well of aware, well aware of this, this post-COVID trend. Mind you, we're still right in the middle of it. Um, but yeah. in regard to the population growth into areas, if we look at Victoria, to Ballarat, yeah. to Bendigo, to Shepparton, to, to Tarragon, and obviously down both peninsulas. So out of that research, we, we looked at a number of those, those key regions around Australia that were going to potentially benefit from, from that population growth influx. And then we also overlaid it with... These, these key regions that, that, that are really attracting some significant federal government and state government uh, infrastructure spending. And ultimately, what the, the theory on that is what's going to drive above trend economic growth in those regions and also population growth and, as a result, retail spend. So we sort of started off with that thesis from a top-down approach point of view. And then we drilled down into who owns the individual properties and we compiled data on you know, the fundamentals of each property. And so, for, for example, we, we ended up in an area like the Latrobe Valley, which is counter-cyclical to what everyone would be thinking about the valley. Um, and we purchased a, a property off Stockland. Um, so what, why, what led us to Draugen was the, fundamentally the strategy. And then secondly was looking at what the Victorian government are doing around transitioning to, to, to brown coal. The layman would think that it's going to close down. In fact, what's happening down there is a significant amount of economic development and transitioning. Um, then we look at a, an, another area. Um, so if, on that Traugan example, locally dominant centre, Kmart, Coles, um, a pharmacy, uh, liquor land, really strong destination centre that dominates um, the, the township and the valley in, in, within a, a 10 to 20 kilometre radius. And the business case for new developments is limited largely because of um, the majors not wanting to come in here. So when we talk about sub-regional, it's your classic Coles, Kmart, Woolworths, and it's, it's backed by those non-discretionary retail, essential services like um, pharmacies, um, your Medibank privates, your private health, 
Um, not sure if liquor is essential services, but it's yeah. certainly out before. For a lot of, I think it has been in the last 18 months, <laughs> Shane. <laughs> It's certainly been one of the strongest performers. And then your mix of your homewares. And the thing we love about um, sub-regional as well is the fact that, you know, less, less e-commerce, um, people really enjoy going in on their on their weekly trips. So, and then another example is, is our recent trust. Um, Mackay is, is considered one of the, the, the six key regional energy infrastructure um, regions in the country, LNG, obviously black coal's got still got a fair bit to run, new hydrogen energy um, announcements up in that region from Mackay to Gladstone. And then once again, coal's came out, Anna Woolworths, and then getting down to granular level in terms of the top-down approach, it's, it's really drilling into um, where the opportunity is in the centre. So we want to understand how profitable the specialty tenants are, how productive they are. And what's interesting, you learn a lot about a community um, and a city when you drill, drill down at that granular level. And um, one of the key findings out of that is that, you know, the, the Mackay region, 12% uh, above high, um, um, average income earning, and they're big spenders. They don't travel as much. Not that anyone's traveled during COVID, but yeah. they... they um, they, they have a very strong appetite for retail spending, and that's represented in the data. So, no, those, sorry, Shane, those sub regional assets, the ones um, that, that you purchased recently, um, we've spoken about the compression of yields for the service stations. Um, what sort of yields are you seeing from these sorts of assets? Yeah, so the, the body of work that we've done over the last 18 months has led us to the regions. And what's really, really important to understand um, also for any of your clients is the fact that there's been less buyers in the market. So if you consider that March to May period last year, a lot of the listed groups, including the REITs, are raising capital. Mm -hmm. So it's diluting retail investors, but they're shoring up their balance sheet. And a number of them, like a stock lamb, were looking to sell out of retail, and reallocate to land developments, industrial supply chain, where they believe they're going to they're going to get uh, long term capital growth. Yeah. So we see that as a buying opportunity. You know, your classic supply demand metrics, less buyers in the market. Where can we leverage our relationships? And so the Mackay one is owned by an institutional CBA super. And they were their their asset managers were were recommending that they reallocate elsewhere, whereas we see that as a great buying opportunity at the right price. Um, and we we obviously um, you know focus on that those key fundamentals mentors to identify value in an asset as well. And and, and as you, I think the income return from the, is around that sort of seven percent mark. Is that about right? Yeah. So for this particular asset, it's six and a half percent. But what we've identified in this asset um, is um, considerable income growth from both the specialty tenants and uh, the the trends over the last three years, where the the moving annual turnover of the centre has continued to grow year on year, uh, which 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 then results in increasing Kmart and Coles rentals. Um, so so we, we, we identify, okay, that's considered a, a very good price. Uh, to give you a bit of an insight into the Traugan example, um, that asset three years ago was valued at 115 million um, and we purchased it for 83 million um, in, uh, well, we settled in March and it had had um, 15 million in capex spent on it only two and a half years earlier. So, so sometimes institutionals will make significant strategy changes. And if you've got good market knowledge, you've done your research um, and you've got good relationships with commercial property agents, you can really leverage that. And what's been important in um, I guess that late, late 2020, the start of 2021 was we were very active while many others were, were sitting on their hands waiting to see what was happening. But we, we, we had done our research to understand the risk associated with that and took very much a long-term approach to 
um, holding the asset. And the Triagon, I think, will be one of our better, better trusts. Um, diversified, obviously, with, with yeah. growth buying the service stations. And as you said, I mean, the intention is to hold the asset. A, a lot of investors or people listening today might think of a shopping centre or a regional, sub-regional shopping centre as somewhat of a passive asset, one that you buy, you collect the rents and that's, that's it. But you mentioned earlier that value add. What, I know that there was some value add opportunities with the Trelgan property, with some subdivisions and, and so forth. And I know there's plans on WA asset that you bought recently. Could you just explain how you go about um, extracting as much value as you can from the actual site? So it's not just a buy and hold type approach. It is a very active approach that you take as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, at the end of the day, we are a developer and there's some groups out there that will take significant development strategies and communicate that to investors. We're, we're not that. Um, but where we like to focus on from a value add point of view is, is what we call the low hanging fruit. So, for example, using the Mirror Booker um, example, um, and I might get my data wrong, but you know, in the order of 15 hectares um, in the 11 kilometres from the Perth CBD, significant site, number of under, underutilised car park areas. So we look to these areas and um, through our national uh, network, so we run an in-house uh, property agency, which has been a real competitive advantage um, for us in this last 18 months from a, 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 from a relationship point of view and the ability to continually collect rental income. Um, but a number of the low-hanging um, value-add opportunities we've identified there is, for example, Dan Murphy's big box format on a site, on a site which is an under, underutilised car park area. Now, that's all about a cost-benefit analysis in terms of what rent it'll bring, what incentive we may need to pay to that particular tenant and what contribution we need to make. Um, but it also, the value adds also result in, okay, is there an opportunity to subdivide that McDonald's on the Traveling Shopping Centre? Is there an opportunity to subdivide the Hungry Jacks and KFC at the Mirabooka Shopping Centre? And to, to um, I guess, communicate and explain that a little bit further, through our knowledge and research, we know that a standalone McDonald's, either in regional Victoria or out of Metro, is currently in the current market, extracting a yield of about 3.5%. Um, so is there an opportunity to subdivide it um, and, and sell that into a, into a Burgess Rawson auction and return some capital to investors? Um, or do we just sit it on the balance sheet? It adds another five million valuation, and that reduces the LVR, and that contributes to the, the investor's unit price value. And then I guess the last one, Glenn, would be the actual um, specialty configurations within the centres itself. Um, so obviously, if you can replace your, your smaller specialty tenants with a JB Hi-Fi or a Cotton On or any national chain with an ASX listed or really strong financially backed group, that's ideally what you want because the valuers will price your, your hair and nail salon or your massage um, shop, um, obviously at a lower or a, or a higher risk um, than your JB high for your cotton on. So not only subdivisions and selling off assets, it's also looking at the tenant profile and saying, well, if we can bring absolutely. in a national carrier, it's going to be more attractive to a potential buyer, which then pushes up the valuation. Absolutely. And we call that just our strategy optimization um, approach. And um, that that's one identified in both exclusive DD and prelim DD. Uh, but then that that's in, um, initiated in the first 12 to 18 months of yeah. ultimately owning the asset. And one thing to have a plan, but it's also to execute. But the important point to make is that we identify the opportunity and then we have to execute it. No, absolutely. With about five minutes to go, I do encourage the attendees to pose any questions that they may have and we'll obviously do our best to try and get through them. Just to, I suppose, close the discussion, Shane, or just finish up on, um, there's been a lot of discussions probably outside of what we've spoken about so far with essential retail or essential services, um, sub-regional shopping centres. There, there has been a lot of discussion 
as a result of, I suppose, this COVID environment that we're living in, um, as to how that will impact commercial property prices, obviously that fear around the retail strip, the fear around office. What are you seeing, I mean, in the market in general, um, how COVID has impacted the market? Um, are there, does that, is that creating opportunities? And potentially, are we seeing a situation where property could change forever? Or is, are some of these things overstated, do you think? Well, I, I think uh, commercial property is always evolving. I mean, if you use your example of, of shopping centres more broadly, um, and if we're sitting here at this time last year and we've seen the impact or the increase in online shopping, um, the, the e-commerce experts will say, well, this is just going to continue to grow year on year. And I think in these periods where we were able to go to our local shopping centres and, and actually uh, walk into a shop and buy something, I think we'll all agree that we still love to go into a shop. Now, the retailers are and now there's real statistical evidence, both globally and here in Australia, that this whole omni-channel, so both the online and the retail presence, bricks and mortar retail presence, is complementary to each other. And the, and the, the online is actually quite an expensive um, cost um, of, of retail. So there's certain, and that, and that will obviously be different from product to product. Um, I guess um, if we if we look back to the middle of last year, it, it presented a considerable opportunity for us because going back five years ago, we were investing in regional shopping centres and we, we had sat out for a four to five year period because of the cap rates or the yields were just too low. We, we couldn't see value, long-term value in buying. Um, and I guess, and, and so, so that's on the retail front. If we sit here today and think, well, who, who would have thought that office CBD would, would have been disrupted as much as it has? Certainly not any of the institutionals or the Aussie super funds or host plus that are, that are developing office buildings in there. So this black swan event has just dislocated and disrupted yeah. and squeezed it into an 18 month period. Um, and so the next, yeah, this is only my insights, but the, the next evolution may in fact be that your local retail areas, where it's your community shopping centres, may actually have more of a hive, hive of activity. Um, I think that's a really good point, Shane. I think quite often that gets lost in the discussion. I mean, even the, the most... Uh, you know, ill-informed property investor would probably agree that, you know, we always hear location, location, location. And that's where, regardless of what the asset is today, I've, you know, I've had the discussion with clients around the importance of location. So, I mean, would you agree that for the very reason that you were saying, just because it's a certain asset today, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be that asset in future and location is and, and tenant profiles becoming as more important as ever, isn't it? Absolutely. So if you look at the two largest discount department stores of the last hundred years in Australia, Meyer and David Jones, and they've, they've decreased their footprint. Yeah. But what's ultimately replaced is, for example, I think it was Northland, has been replaced by co-working areas. Yeah. And that's going to complement right. foot traffic into the centre, expenditure with your local cafes, your stores, etc. So, uh, you know, co-working's obviously been around for a long time. So you've got a situation there where your co-working may have dried up in the CBD, but it's popped up in a shopping centre where the, the leases historically were too high um, because they were, the, the leases were taken by David Jones and Meyer. And now they've been replaced by a co-working space and suddenly it becomes quite a profitable part of the shopping centre for that property owner. So, um, and, and I, I certainly think there some of these, that you, our, our local um, community meeting uh, destinations will potentially be some of those co-working spaces. So I think naturally what happens, there'll be winners and losers. And, um, and I guess, at the heart of it, and as I know we've spoken about a lot, Glenn, is is it's all about diversification, isn't it? It is, and look, just to just to close, I, I think that if you know, if I'm putting bringing together the the key takeouts for me, and hopefully 
for our attendees. I think, as you were discussing, even in a low interest rate environment, there's still very strong opportunities to invest in assets that can provide a very strong, very sustainable income over a long period of time. I think we both agree, and through the discussion we've had, that yes, COVID may have changed property in the short term, but unlikely to be as disastrous perhaps as what some commentators are saying right now. But I think as just to close, I mean, that, that very point you made there, the importance of diversification, not just across different types of assets, but also within the property asset class. So not, if you're concerned about property, then don't put all your money in property. If you have that diversified exposure, which as, as we've spoken about, Faulkner provides through its service stations, shopping centers, childcare centers, um, that can really provide a really good outcome uh, for, for investors. So look, on, on that note, thank you so much, Shane, for joining us today. Thanks, 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 to thanks everyone. Great, that's been a great discussion. Thanks a lot to, to all the attendees. As I said, this is the first quarter of four um, that, that we plan to, to bring to all of our clients and, and non-clients and people that we work with very closely. Um, we've con we have confirmed this, the second quarter of the four quarter series, which will be in early February, uh, where our MD, Andrew Hiddleston, will be joined by two senior economists from Macquarie um, and Ernst Young to talk about the economic outlook and conditions for 2022. So if you're like me, those discussions are always really insightful. Um, so we'll keep an eye out for those details. And, and look, thanks again for everyone who's attending. And, and Shane, thanks for, for your time today. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone.